Can, can, I, I, I absolutely enjoyed the, the presentation that Ken gave us there. And it's, it's clear Ken is up, completely immersed in the issues around curriculum for excellence, very expert in it. Uh, and it's, it's valuable for us to get his insight into how that's developing and what he sees in are the challenges for the university sector. Uh, the, the, the title here is uh, Universities and, and the Curriculum for Excellence and, and we, we clearly have not been as immersed in the whole process but it is something that we are interested in. And uh, and, and so why are we interested? We, we, quite often it's considered that we sit in ivory towers as universities, but clearly a large proportion of the entrants into our schools come from the Scottish school system. About 40% of our first year undergraduate students coming to the university are coming from a Scottish domicile and are under 18. Uh, so very soon we are going to have the output from the school sector which has come through curriculum for excellence route uh, into our universities and, and we need to reflect that as we look at our, our curriculum, as we look at our learning teaching methodology. Uh, we, we do recognise, as Ken has described, that, that it's not a new curriculum in the conventional sense. There's not a, a major overhaul of content, but there is a very significant change to how that process has been, has been carried through in the school sector. The new learning and teaching approaches which are designed to encourage active learning, uh, more discussion, more debate and, and enhance critical thinking in the students who are coming through the school sector. Uh, we need to take into account what we do within the university sector to reflect those changes. And we know there will be changes to hires and advanced hires. We know they're going to be replacing standard grades with Nationals 4 and 5, and we need to understand exactly what's in Nationals 4 and 5 in terms of content, in terms of assessment methodology. Uh, and importantly, there is a change to how the senior phase of school, uh, secondary 4 to 6, is going to be organised, and there will be more variation. It will not be as regimented as it's been in the past, uh, and there will be more personalisation within schools. So that are pretty significant implications for us in our admissions processes and in our learning and teaching methodologies we move forward. And we are not insignificant in this debate as many of you will have picked up because other people are very interested in, in how we react to the whole curriculum for excellence change that's coming through. We need to continue to ensure that uh, we give uh, a fair crack of the work to all of the pupils coming through the system and uh, we need to make sure that we have a coherent, transparent and, and fair learning structure. Uh, the Scottish Government are clearly interested, they, they want to make sure that universities respond through admissions processes, through learning and teaching and they are particularly interested in what we do around secondary six. Uh, and level seven within universities and level seven within colleges. Uh, and that's a feature that comes up quite regularly. Uh, school pupils are clearly want to know uh, what are the implications for them as and if they aspire to progress through the university, how are we going to reflect that within our admissions processes? And, and parents are similarly very concerned. Uh, and we need to be giving very clear messages out uh, on what we're going to do about that. Uh, so we have become involved. Uh, it's, CFE is not a responsibility, it's not a model, it's very much a school uh, model. Um, but we, we have been involved and we have engaged in the process. We have had uh, Grant Jarvey, who many of you will know uh, as a professor at Stirling University, uh, on the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. There has been a lot of engagement across the sector. Uh, with individual members of staff in the development of vice qualifications and subject areas. Uh, our schools of education have also been very involved. They are, they are responsible for developing the teachers of the future. They clearly are looking at what the implications are for their curriculum as, as they develop uh, their teacher training programs. And, and there has been increasing elements of, of interaction between 
universities and schools and local authorities, particularly at secondary six. And I'll touch on some examples of those that have been picked up and have been through some of the research into this area. Uh, and it has culminated in the University of Scotland report beyond the senior phase. Uh, and, and if you haven't read that report, uh, I would commend it to you. It, it, it's an interesting read. Uh, and it sets a lot of interesting challenges for university and the university sector. But there has been engagement with the curriculum for excellence through University of Scotland Learning Teaching Committee in particular, and that's one of the core committees of the University of Scotland. We have a range of clearly learning and teaching is an important one, <coughs> research and knowledge exchange is an important one. There are a range of our committees, but this is one of the big ones, and that the Learning and Teaching Committee has taken overall responsibility for how we interact with curriculum for excellence. Uh, and that committee managed to access some funding support from the Scottish Government. Uh, and it's very boldly worded there that the University of Scotland uh, ensured that they maintained editorial control. Uh, so funding support for the exercise was very worthwhile, just beyond the senior phase. And it was interesting for me because I did talk with senior government officials and, and with ministers and cabinet secretary not long before uh, Beyond the Senior Phase came out and they were very interested to know what the university sector were going to be saying about curriculum for excellence and their interaction with it. Uh, and, and clearly they had no editorial control over what was happening. In order to take the issue forward, the process that was set up by the Learning and Teaching Committee was to develop, uh, to set up a, a, a task group. Uh, the obvious chair for that was Grant Jarvey because he's on the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. But to do it fairly widely from across the sector, uh, broad representation, Learning and Teaching Committee members, uh, admissions tutors or directors, uh, we did bring in a university secretary because we always do that in any committee we set up. Uh, and, and we did bring in a member of a, a university court, Judith Sitchie from Queen Margaret University, uh, because there are government issues. We, courts are interested in what's happening in this agenda. And the money paid for some consultancy support, and Sally Brown and, and Sarah Minty uh, provided the consultancy support, support for the group. Uh, and there was continual close engagement with Petra Wen, who's the principal of Queen Margaret University, and who, until the end of July, will be chairing uh, the, the University of Scotland Learning Teaching Committee. Uh, so th there has been a fairly widespread engagement, and, and that has been seen as, as an important development for the universities. And the report, there's a nice picture of it there, uh, the report came out in May and it does identify actions for the universities uh, and does provide background information on curriculum for excellence, does provide links to resources on curriculum for excellence for universities that they can access and have the need to access as we move forward and, and does produce a timeline for curriculum for excellence implementation and a timeline for actions for universities. Uh, and, and quite challenging thing there, and that's contained in the report. And we're all going to have to absorb that as universities and think about how to cope with, with uh, what's in, those, uh, in that set of, of actions that have been asked of us. As I said, the politicians were interested in hearing what we as universities were saying about curriculum for excellence. But clearly, other stakeholders were very interested. Now, just quickly run through some quotes. Uh, and Ken Cunningham's uh, quote was, with this kind of commitment to collaboration and communication on the part of schools, universities, colleges and government, the future prospects of Scotland's young people as they move to future studies should be assured. Building on existing good relationships, we have been very pleased to be involved in this particular consultation and are delighted at the promise contained in this work. So, pretty positive. Uh, Eileen Pryor, the Executive Director of the Scottish Parent Teacher Council, uh, had comments where the parents and carers have been seeking reassurance for some time around university admissions for young people who are studying within the curriculum for excellence. 
a more flexible school system cannot create penalties for young people who want to go on to a higher education. I believe this report is a welcome step forward, which will go some way to, towards providing parents with the comfort they seek. And finally, the, the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, AIDS, again welcomed the report. AIDS welcomes the report and in particular the commitment of universities to review their admissions policies. It's essential that universities are active partners in the implementation of curriculum for excellence and that more flexible approaches are available for learners journey through education, which includes the transition between school and university. Schools are going to have different processes when they deal with curriculum for excellence uh, and that has implications for us and we need to make sure that we deal fairly with the output from the system. Uh, and we're going to have to look at what the implications are for us. And, and I just want to touch a bit on admissions first, because that's clearly the most sensitive area at this point in time. Uh, and the first thing to say is, is <coughs> universities are autonomous institutions and organisations. They make their own admissions decisions. Uh, there may be a criticism of universities that individual admissions tutors make their own admissions decisions. Uh, but, but, but universities will make their own admissions decisions. Within the report beyond the senior phase, there are two overarching recommendations which are, are pretty important. Uh, there is a request that university leaders affirm that they continue to be committed to a fair admissions policies with equal consideration of suitable candidates irrespective of senior phase opportunities may vary from school to school or local authority area to local authority area. Uh, and I request that there is a review of admissions policies and practice within each institution to ensure that this can happen. And so there is a, there's a timetable contained within uh, Grant Jarvin's report, or, or the group's report, which is really requesting that during 2012-13, each university will plan for how admission systems will be revised and then publish guidance for schools and prospective students during the 2012-13 year, uh, which is challenging, but, but fundamentally, uh, the group is saying, has to happen. So we, as universities, feel we have to, the admission side, take some actions. Uh, and, and we need to try and ensure that applicants aren't penalised because of how individual schools or local authorities have implemented the senior phase elements. We need to have clearer expectations of the knowledge and skills uh, applicants are required to bring to the university. We need to produce fairly rapidly uh, our guidance uh, and, and the report was requesting that we review any unusual requirements, for example five hires at one sitting, to ensure that they remain fair and reasonable. We have variable processes within local authority areas or local authority schools. What we would like is, is some actions from others. Uh, education reports from schools will be valuable. Uh, we have limited sets of exam results, some <coughs> courses will do interviews, we'll get uh, personal statements or references, but if we have a more coherent education report, uh, that will help admissions tutors and admissions processes. It will provide richer information. Uh, and, and we may want to look for something similar <coughs> to the Higher Education Achievement Report here, the coming from the Burgess recommendations. And Burgess is recommending that all universities across the UK now, from 12-13, start from 12, 13 entrants start producing their reports for the students, which will be fairly concise electronic documents which captures uh, the student achievement during their higher education. Not just exams of class, but, but, but wider achievements and knowledge and experience that are picked up. If we can get <coughs> better quality education reports coming through, through the curriculum for evidence, it may allow us to widen the net of people who, who come through into the university sector. Uh, and uh, Ken was highlighting the discrepancy that currently exists. And there is a massive gap. Uh, and we, we have a big challenge coming up for the time CFE starts producing 
out to we are going to see very, very significant reductions in those coming through the school sector in 2015-2016. Numbers coming out of schools are going to drop quite significantly. We need to be able to cope with that and cope with, cope with different output coming through from curriculum for excellence. Uh, we, we need to think about implications for learning and teaching and our learning and teaching methods. Uh, and we have, as, as all of you are fully aware, we have the Scottish sector involvement in enhancement teams uh, and currently developing support of curriculum is clearly one of those and curriculum for excellence is very relevant to that. Uh, curriculum development clearly a core part of what we do and, and on the slide there part of the work and with the group identify major curriculum reforms which take place. Uh, recently Aberdeen has had a very major exercise in the units curriculum as has a Royal Conservatoire. But all universities uh, regularly review the programmes, uh, have the module reviews, it's a module review by an annual process across many institutions. Uh, and it is, is part the core part of how we operate and we op regularly update uh, our materials. Uh, this morning this, there's not a lot of people from UWS here today because today we have our annual learning and teaching conference, uh, which is down in one of our other campuses down in here. Uh, so the clash is a bit unfortunate. Uh, and the, the, the theme for that conference, which involves staff students uh, and, and is absolutely jam packed, there was a waiting list for it, uh, and, uh, and, and has externals involved in it as well. Uh, it's an inclusive and integrated curriculum for all. It's not about curriculum for excellence per se, but it's looking at curriculum development and how we make it more inclusive. Uh, and, and I certainly, as principal, was really pleased to go down there this morning and, and see a full house uh, and be told that there was a waiting list for people to go and come on to the, the day. Uh, and the Scottish sector is involved in enhancement themes. Uh, and just pick up QA. I'm frank to say too much about QA because of people here. Uh, I, I, for me, the system here in Scotland is, is immeasurably better than the system elsewhere. Uh, I, I, it is based on enhancing. And, and certainly when I speak to people overseas, I, I get very positive feedback on how the layer system and the mechanisms we have for enhancement here in Scotland. Um, sometimes quite a bit of jealousy. Uh, but it's about a combination of institution, uh, institutional and national action. We have the earlier system where we get specifics. And you all know that slide come, that came to us last year and we had a report. Uh, and our new learning teaching assessment strategy has been driven out of that report. We picked up specifics from it uh, and lessons. It was a very good report, wasn't it? And uh, we, we, put, we use that institutional level. But we have national action through our themes uh, and, and the current themes around the curriculum. And, and it's all about enhancing student experience. Uh, and one of the recent themes, not that recent anymore, but uh, one of the themes we have gone through is learning and teaching uh, and as, as the graduates for the 21st century. Uh, and I know how much work went on in this university looking at what do we want as graduate attributes, how do we involve the students in all of that process. Uh, but all universities have gone through that. Uh, and again, we are uh, all separate institutions and in we had, had their own exercises or we learned from everyone else. Um, but uh, what we looked at is what attributes do we want in our graduates and how can we help our students develop, develop those attributes. And although it's different in different universities, there were common commonality across the Scottish sector. Uh, and basically everyone was saying. We want our students to come out to have an understanding of lifelong learning, to have the capacity for research and scholarship and inquiry, uh, to be employable and have employability skills and career development, understanding, to be global citizens, uh, to have good communication skills and information literacy, uh, to understand ethics, uh, social and professional understanding, uh, to have personal and intellectual autonomy, and to be able to work in teams and be collaborative and ensure leadership. Those were the kind of common themes uh, which came through that uh, 
uh, exercise of reviewing what how individual universities have looked at what they want from graduate attributes. And it is interesting to mark that on to curriculum for excellence. Maybe a lot more concise than curriculum for excellence, but the four capacities that curriculum for excellence is trying to develop within pupils coming through the school system. Uh, they want effective contributors, successful learners, confident individuals, and responsible citizens you can have. A bit of that over to what we are saying we want as graduate attributes. So what we are picking up is partially completed uh, models coming out from the school system. And we need to think how, how do we build on that? Are our current, is our current curriculum, is our current learning teaching methodology the most appropriate to pick up those who are coming through the, the CFE route? Uh, so there is interest in the curriculum for excellence team. It is one of the influences on university curricula as we move forward. We have been trying to get as much information out into the sector as possible. Uh, there have been briefings uh, and these have been delivered and will continue to be delivered. Today's symposium is, is, is one of those processes. And our learning and teaching committee, which still is chaired by Petra Wayne, uh, will take a lead. In, in, in this process. And it will be awareness raising uh, and uh, trying to make sure that the sector is, is understands as much as possible what's coming through the for instance, process uh, and, and is preparing for that. And I said earlier that there is increased collaboration between schools and universities and we have identified some interesting examples of, of how those developments are moving forward in secondary universities and I'll, I'll just very quickly run through some uh, as exemplars because these are the ones we've identified. In Dundee City Campus, these two universities, the University of Albert Tate, uh, are involved in the delivery of minority hires and advanced hires uh, to local pupils. It gives a much better choice to those stu potential students uh, and, and is a most cost effective way forward. And it is, universities are well equipped to do that work. And it's an effect of an interesting project which is taking place. And it does illustrate increased collaboration, particularly around uh, secondary six. Uh, there is an exercise in Aberdeen, University of Aberdeen. Uh, and Aberdeen Grammar and Ellen, Ellen Academy are working together. And it's around science subjects uh, offered the course in North East Schools. We've been working since 2009. Uh, and, and it's given wider experience. And we're going to roll that exercise out across all of Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Schools in the academic year 2012. And, and Aberdeen University want to expand it into <coughs> other subjects. And it's, and it's a good example of using skill set which sits within the university sector uh, and, and tying that more closely to what's happening in the school sector and including that, that, that transition process. And Queen Margaret University have a hospitality academy and they're working with uh, Julian S College, the Slovene Council, local schools and local employers in that particular industry uh, which is a priority sector in the East Coast. Um, and creating uh, vocational and academic groups working in collaboration. And, and the major focus is addressing skills gaps identified by the industry. And the industry is part of the process of delivery. And the final slide is OU as a young applicant school scheme, where secondary six people can actually choose to do one undergraduate module. Uh, and, and that's been working successfully. And here at Watt have a, a scheme, a scholar program, uh, which is providing online learning resource supported students at higher and advanced higher level. Uh, and, and again, is, is an interesting development and shows better collaboration than perhaps have been there in the past. But most universities are, are working with the school sector, particularly around baccalaureate. I know UWS, which was not one of the examples picked up, all three of our campuses are working with the baccalaureate schools around the Britons. So here in Paisley, in there, and in Hamilton, uh, we provide 
physical resources uh, and also we provide some direct support, support, academic support, particularly uh, to the project elements in the faculty. Area. So, so many of these things are happening. Mm. I, I touched on, see, this is quite close to my heart, uh, on the perceived overlap at SCQF level 7 between secondary 6 in school, advanced higher Scottish baccalaureates, year 1 at university, and HNC at college. Um, it, it, it's it's an, an interesting area. In 2010, University of Scotland set up a working group that was chaired by myself and Steve Chapman from Perry at Watt University, which was looking at Scottish solutions. Scottish solutions were primarily focusing on the financial challenges that the sector was facing. And it was an interesting piece of work we did over the summer, started early June, and produced a report by August. And there were two things that, that came apart as we did that work. One was around long-term funding from universities and the challenges which are there, uh, particularly identifying the funding gap between Scotland and England. And you may remember that this appeared in the press quite a lot to the Herald and the Scotsman like to run with the funding gap that's going to exist, and that was quite a significant issue as we headed towards <coughs> the elections and then we headed towards the spending review. But the other significant thing that we picked up in that report was looking at the SEQF and the efficiency of the SEQF and particularly looking at level 7. Uh, and, and we did refer to the learner journey uh, and I think that's the first time the term learner journey was used because you can see a real dysfunctional element in level 7. Uh, and, and we do think there are, there are real challenges. And clearly Scottish Government uh, would like more pupils to move from secondary six into second year in universities, which I don't think any of us are against in any way, but we need to have the right underpinning to move into uh, second year in universities. And, and there, are, there are issues around that. Uh, we, we have, particularly for A-level students, and particularly for A-level students from England, many universities will offer direct entry into second year of the degree programme. And, and a lot of those students who are offered direct entry into second year don't accept it. Uh, and that's an increasing problem. And in fact, they said choice if the first come into first year, they'll do both part of the cohort of students, but they are worried that they're missing out some core underpinning. Uh, to go directly into second year. So there is an issue around that. And, and some who enter second year actually opt to go back into first year fairly rapidly. There is a challenge around the availability of advanced hires and, and Scottish baccalaureates. Uh, getting a coherent grouping in those is not easy uh, and, and will, will require some, uh, some clever thinking. And that may well involve clever thinking, not just uh, in schools or collaborations of schools, but, but schools with colleges, with universities, and how we can make that work better. Uh, and, and there still is a challenge around curriculum match, uh, which we need to look at. <coughs> and, and professional bodies, as we all know, can, can be a bit stroppy about things. But I think that's manageable. Uh, I, I've, for many, many years, sat in professional body accreditation panels and central panels. And these, these things can be managed, but, but that, that is one issue that we need to be looked at. But so advanced entry going forward, I think what universities are saying is, yeah, we're happy, but let's get let's get the pathway right. Let's do it for the learners. Uh, and if, if CFE can be used as a mechanism to make that much a much better uh, learner journey, we, we should be working together to make a better learner journey. But there are still challenges in doing that. There will be a workshop, or there was a workshop, sorry, in March. There will be a subgroup of curriculum for uh, Excellence Management Board looking at transitions after school and at secondary six. We will want to be fully engaged with these six significant numbers of secondary six students to enter the university. And we would want to look at a range of possible learner journeys, which would suit the <coughs> Uh, and we don't think it's a relevant, it's a completely simple process. And University of Scotland and Curriculum for Excellence into the future, we will continue to engage 
with the Scottish Government with Education Scotland, SQA, local authorities and schools at a sector level and as individual institutions. And I talked about some of the work that's happening at, at uh, secondary six. But for this university there's some really interesting possibilities coming up. Uh, we, we have an increasing gallery council always committed in now to putting an upper secondary level school uh, beside our campus, a, a joint campus with the University of Glasgow and Greece. So that would be secondary four, five and six. And, and that would give really interesting possibilities for collaborative work. At South Ayrshire Council are similarly very keen to put a new secondary school co-located with their campus. And both of these have colleges right beside them as well. And you can get very interesting developments moving forward. The challenges as well. But we are, we are committed to, to working uh, on, on these agendas going forward. Uh, and we will want to take forward the recommendations in the report. And that's me.